Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on this webinar, Elder Abuse Explained, presented by Compass. My name is Justine Sliss. It is my pleasure and an honour to be facilitating the panel. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. This webinar on Elder Abuse Explained is brought to you by Compass. Compass is the national website connecting people to services and information tackling elder abuse in all its forms. Compass is created by Elder Abuse Action Australia with funding from the Australian Government Attorney General's Department. As Compass is the national information hub on elder abuse, every asset, resource, organisations that panellists ref will refer to is on Compass. And the Compass website is compass.info. Compass is committed to ensuring equitable and inclusive responses to an end elder abuse for everyone affected, including people with diverse characteristics and life experiences. If you or someone you know needs help tackling elder abuse, go to compass.info. There is also an elder helpline, 1800 Elder Help, 1800 353 3. Seven, four. We invite you during the webinar to ask questions via the Q&A function. We'll endeavour to answer as many as we can during the 60 minutes. If we don't get you to your question, please don't hesitate to send us an email. Inquiry at compass.info. When asking the question, please be respectful to not name or identify people. During the webinar, there will be a poll be sure to take part in it. We'll be sharing the results of the poll with you at the end of the seminar. The poll will be six short questions taken from the Australian Human Rights Commission. Today, we are joined by an expert panel and it is my pleasure to introduce them to you. Gerard Mansour, Commissioner for Seniors Victoria and Ambassador for Elder Abuse Prevention. Dr. Ray Caspi, Director, Research Director, Systems and Services of the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Professor Bioni Dow, Director at National Aging Research Institute, NARI. For full, full details and bio of everybody, please go to compass.info. The panel discussion will draw upon expertise that responds to the five areas of elder abuse. And we'll start with a question for, for Dr. Ray Caspian. During Ray's press, um, response, we're going to share some slides with you. Dr. Ray, the Attorney General's Department commissioned the most extensive empirical examination of elder abuse in Australia, the prevalence study. Can you tell us briefly the findings and what more needs to happen based on the research. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Uh, and thank you if we could display the slides. Uh, so I'm speaking today about the National Elder Abuse Prevalence Study, which was completed um, by a team at the Australian Institute of Family Studies uh, and funded by the Attorney General's Department. Um, it's the most extensive study on elder abuse in Australia to date. I want to just acknowledge before I start explaining some of the key findings um, that the views you're hearing today um, are my views as an author of the uh, report, uh, and they're not the views of the Australian Institute of Family Studies or the Australian Government. Um, the abuse, the um, Elder Abuse National Prevalence Study was completed by a team um, at the Institute comprising Leisha Chu, the um, lead author, me, Rachel Carson, Dinika Rupani, John DeMeo, Jackie Harvey and Bryony Horsfall. Um, this extensive research program comprised uh, three elements, a nationally representative study of 7,000 
community dwelling Australians aged 65 and over, the survey of older people. I do want to emphasise that this, is, uh, this, this research is based on a community dwelling sample. So experiences that aren't covered um, are those of people in residential care settings uh, and those of people who may have experienced um, cognitive decline to an extent that meant that they were unable to participate in the survey. So we still have knowledge gaps in Australia in those areas, um, and they are important areas to focus on in future research. Uh, we also looked at attitudes to elder abuse and awareness of elder abuse um, based on a nationally representative survey of 3,400 Australians aged 18 to 64. That was the general community survey. And we also um, included a culturally and linguistically diverse um, sub-study, uh, which was based on specific analysis of the um, subsample, um, the subsamples in both of those surveys um, of people who identified as culturally and linguistically diverse. Uh, I'm now turning to talk about the definition that we applied in the research. Um, we had a conceptual definition uh, which was a single or repeated act or failure to act, including threats that results in harm or distress to an older person. These occur where there's an expectation of trust and or where there is a power imbalance between the party responsible and the older person. So you can see from that definition that it's quite high level and it's quite conceptual. Um, and the key elements of the definition are bolded. Um, I'll talk more specifically about what we found um, in a moment and, and the operational approaches and measures that were used. Uh, we looked at four, the four core, um, the five core subtypes of elder abuse, uh, financial, physical, sexual abuse, neglect, and psychological abuse. Um, in relation to the called substudy, we also examined uh, a subtype of specific abuse for that population um, that we refer to as abuse relating to language and culture. I'm now turning to the overall prevalence findings. Uh, and basically what we found is that the overall prevalence rate of abuse is 15%. Uh, so 15% of our sample and 15% of Australians living in the community aged 65 and over um, reported experiencing at least one subtype of abuse. The most prevalent form of abuse was psychological abuse, followed at 12%, followed by neglect at 3%, financial abuse and physical abuse each at 2%, and sexual abuse at 1%. 4% of the people who experienced elder abuse experienced multiple types of abuse. I should just briefly refer to the fact that whilst the prevalence between men, men and women overall um, was not particularly remarkable, uh, there are nonetheless some subtle gendered patterns in the data, including the fact that women are more likely to experience sub some subtypes of abuse including um, neglect and sexual abuse. And that when we look at perpetrator patterns, overall men outweigh women as perpetrators by 10 percentage points. Uh, overall, family members are the largest perpetrator group um, with uh, sons and daughters at 18%, partners and spouses at 10% and sons or daughter-in-laws at 7%. It is notable, however, that social connections are also well represented. Uh, and this um, is relevant to the point about a power imbalance in our definition. We found a difference between people who experienced uh, elder abuse from family members and people who experienced elder abuse from social connections. Um, and among the latter group, vulnerabilities um, relating to mental ill health um, or, or, cycle, or, or um, uh, physical problems or social isolation uh, were more prominent. Um, so that underlines the importance of the concept of a power imbalance. 
Um, so you'll see that neighbours, friends and acquaintances uh, were between uh, eight, eight, uh, nine percent and 12 percent among perpetrator groups. I'm just going to talk in a little bit more depth now about how we mes measured psychological abuse. Uh, we applied an approach that was based on a, a scoring uh, mechanism uh, with uh, scores in the range of low, medium and high. Um, that was based on the frequency and the number of different types of um, psychological abuse um, measures that people responded affirmatively to. Um, I should say that even though uh, the low score range is um, more, more prevalent um, than the other two ranges, so not much more than, than the high score range, um, it is important to note that people who experienced uh, or who fell into the low score range um, were um, did experience adverse consequences, um, including distress, um, and did report it. And so that tells us that's not an inconsequential experience. I'm turning now just to some of the specific questions we asked. Um, and you'll see that um, they were around things like offensive or aggressive insults, exclusion, undermining and belitt belittling, preventing contact with family, doctors and nurses, um, threats of harm and threats of harm to self. And then there's a catch-all of anything else to cause emotional distress. That was selected by quite a high proportion of respondents or participants, 46%, um, um, underlining the fact that, um, uh, you know, these, um, these behaviours are, are quite wide in their manifestation and there is a range of behaviours that are covered um, in this concept. I'm now sharing um, a, a similar, the, the findings for neglect. Um, so again, neglect was based on a score. Um, we had a range of activities in neglect um, that relate to things that you need for assistance um, in terms of daily living. Um, and that there, there is a defined person who's responsible for meeting those needs and they're not meeting them. So you'll see, for example, that 18% of our participants um, needed help with routine housework. Um, there was a person defined um, to be that helper um, but wasn't helping. So other uh, commonly selected responses um, were uh, not helping with travel or transport, um, or, and not helping with shopping for groceries or clothes uh, and preparing meals. Um, the next um, one I will focus on is financial abuse. Uh, and again, the kind of measures we used here were around um, a range of behaviours, including pressure to give or loan money, possessions or property, which was the most common, um, taking money, possessions or property without permission, uh, not contributing to household expenses where there's a commitment to, um, deliberately preventing you from accessing your own money, property and possessions, uh, pressure to make or change a will, um, making financial decisions without permission um, or anything else to cause financial harm. Um, turning now to physical abuse and what that looks like and how um, prevalent the different actions in physical abuse are, um, it was threats to harm was the most commonly selected response at 61%, um, but there was a, a range of actual physical contact um, occurrences reported by our participants, uh, including grabbing, pushing, shoving, hitting, punching, kicking, slapping, um, threats with weapons, um, tying down and restraints, uh, giving you too much medicine or drugs to control you and making um, you diet docile um, and injuring with weapons. So um, that's quite a significant spectrum of um, fairly severe behaviours represented there um, and fairly commonly reported. Uh, in terms of sexual abuse, the questions we are asked were around um, unwanted sexual talk at 77%, unwanted sexual touching, um, and that was nominated by 32% of the sexual abuse, um, people who experienced sexual abuse and um, nominated that, uh, that, that, that experience in our survey. 
For sexual acts, acts were reported by 16% of the sexual abuse group um, and uh, attempts to engage um, the participant in other unwanted sexual experience, again, pointing to the breadth um, of the experiences uh, was nominated by 34%. I'll just turn quickly to the implications of our findings. Um, it's a very detailed study. There's a lot of information in the study, so I do uh, recommend that you, uh, you look at it and perhaps access also, also our fact sheets. Um, we consider that there needs to be uh, an evidence-based prevention framework developed. There needs to be um, a systematic screening and assessment um, in, in settings that older people um, are represented in, such as health settings. Um, there needs to be awareness raising of elder abuse and how to get help. Um, targeted both at older people, but also uh, at the people that they turn to for help. They most commonly uh, turn to friends and family for help. So uh, those people know need to know what avenues are available for help. Um, so they're the main, uh, the main uh, key findings from the study. Uh, thank you, Justine. Thank you so much. That was um, an extraordinary overview of, of complex and, and um, varied response. That, that's fantastic. Can I just um, thank you all for the questions that you put in, in the Q&A? And we might move on to the poll now. As I said, the poll comes from um, from the, the Human Rights Commission, and it's six questions. I, I do encourage you all to, to engage with the poll. It's up on the screen now. And we will share the results at the end of the session. I do also want to say that um, if you answer um, no to any of these, um, then you may wish to talk to somebody that you can trust. Um, take into consideration the questions and please do visit compass.info or call the L the helpline 1-800-353-374. There's an enormous mm -hmm. amount to get through in this webinar. Um, just take a moment with this. We will close it in a few seconds and share the results with you at the end of this webinar. We'll address some of the questions in the, the chat as well. Thank you again for putting those in. Um, I, I just might ask Ray this, just in, in answer to one of the first questions that came up. Um, somebody is citing 50 cases a week being, in, being reported in Australia. Do you have the, those kind of stats? Does that, does that um, match what your research was saying? In terms oh, of yeah, it depends on the setting that the um, the questioner is referring to. Um, uh, you know, it's it's not clear. You know, there's a, a variety of mechanisms that you can report to, including helplines. Um, you know, police. Yes. Uh, what I will say is that our study found that elder abuse was very underreported. People who experience it are more likely than not not to tell anybody. Where they do tell people, the most common people they tell are friends and family and health professionals. Okay, thank you. I just, um, we'll just move on to our next question. And again, thanks everybody for taking part in the poll. I want to ask um, Commissioner Jared Mansour, um, as Commissioner, you and your team have developed a range of resources to help tackle elder abuse. Can you tell us about them and, and where we can find those? Yeah, thanks very much, Justine. And I want to congratulate Ray for the important leadership that um, that research has provided. One of the big gaps before that was a continual circular, circular discussion about, you know, what is the prevalence, what are the experiences of people? Um, and that, that's enormously important in informing our practice. Uh, and just by way of context, Justine, so my key interest and involvement 
um, is as ambassador for elder abuse prevention. So the Victorian government, in response to our own Royal Commission on Family Violence, acknowledged elder abuse as a form of family violence. And part of that response was to ask me to have a particular role in representing the interests and focusing on prevention for older people. So there's two things I was keen to touch on um, in these opening comments. And the first that I think we've all got a positive role we can play in addressing key drivers from a prevention perspective. That's, you know, the objective that in the long term, a far lesser number of people experience any form of abuse. And to do that, we, you know, we can all play a role in addressing the key drivers, things like ageism, things like um, gender inequity and gender based violence. Um, things about power imbalance. So we can all play a role from a positive sense in promoting the right of people of all ages, uh, including older people, to be treated with respect and dignity. And so I think there's a rights paradigm that really informs my approach to this that we should not take for granted. And people, just because they get older, have no less right than they do at any other point of their life. And so for me, that's a really important part of my work as a commissioner and as ambassador uh, to, to work with many, many stakeholders about addressing those key, you know, structural drivers to abuse. But one of the things that I've learned in a lot of my conversations with older people is there, there are things that we can do individually that also help us be less at risk. One of the bits of data that really stood out to me in the, in the research that Ray talked about was the reference that only one third of people that were experiencing abuse actually had reached out for support. And that's very consistent with what I often hear from older people. And so a few years ago, we we drove a project here in Victoria where we talked with groups of older people about what type of resources and support would assist them to have, if you like, a, a partner or someone as a trusted person with them, someone who could they could, could confide in, express their wishes to, um, someone that was like a, a key player for them in their life and that they could pick the right person to do that. And it led to the creation of a publication called Your Voice, trust your choice. And whilst it's a Victorian-based publication, it does give a lot of the, the information that older people themselves said they would like about how they could pick the right people and identify the people that were the close confidence for them in their lives. And I think that's, you know, that is a thing that all of us can do. We can think about making sure that we, we express to those close in our lives what our expectations are. And that if things are happening to us that we believe fundamentally under, undermine our rights, we've actually got a pathway to someone that can help us talk about what action and resources may, what we might want to take. And I was very pleased as part of the Commonwealth Government's response to um, elder abuse from the national strategy that the Victorian publication around powers of attorney was, it was a similar paradigm to create uh, a national publication, which is you decide who decides from a financial power of attorney perspective. So I think that's one of, one of the really important things from my point of view, when we think about prevention, to think about it in two levels, to think about it as structural prevention, what are the things that we can all do collectively to better protect the rights of, of all of us uh, in the community as we age, addressing key drivers like ageism, gender inequality, and power imbalance. So they're key structural things we can all put our mind to and all play a role in some way. And then at a more individual level, um, guiding and helping people that all of us in our lives have trusted individuals that understand our wishes and that we've got a pathway um, uh, you know, if we do get into the situation of becoming one of those one in six, uh, and it often is something that comes to my mind, Justine, and I've reflected over the years, if I've got 100 older people in a room, which I very, you know, very regularly do talk to lots of older people at the local community level, I always sort of remind myself that we can't easily identify who's at risk. 
because none of us can easily predict as we get older what are the things that might change and influence our vulnerability as we age. So I think from a universal perspective that whilst on the one hand we can focus on, on rights and structural issues, we can also do more to empower individuals to have you know, the right people around them, understand that supports and resources are available, that there's a hotline. Um, there are organisations that have a really key role in assisting and supporting older people. Thank you so much, Gerard. I think that, you know, who can they tell? I think, you know, having those key people around you, it's critical, isn't it? And those statistics, the one in six, um, that's incredibly um, confronting. I guess, um, you know, on that, because we are on an online webinar and a lot of the resources are online, um, how do you see that playing out when we talk about the digital divide? and people who are older who, who may not necessarily be able to or know about um, different levels of access online. I know there's a helpline people can call. What do you think about that? Yeah, look, it's part of what we've we've tried to do in Victoria is consistently find the balance of both, both you know both sides of that. I think I think the digital divide has a couple of elements to it. I think um, one of the key elements is that all of us, all organisations and systems, think about alternative pathways. You know, where people aren't able to be digitally connected, and there will always be groups of people in that category. What are the alternative real person pathways? And with the Your Voice Trust Your Choice publication, and I'm not sure of this will work online but you know in victoria we you know we actually published a booklet um, for that reason as well as an online resource um, but i think there's a there's another side to that justine which goes to the rights type thing so many times i hear this like myth that our uh, older people don't want to be online and some of my you know really strong research um, tells us that often older people and their interest in technology is hugely underestimated and with the right training and support that there can be a whole range of pathways that open up and I think it's a balance of those two. It's about making sure we've always got alternatives but let's not under us estimate the interest and in the skills of older people to actually engage with digital technology either. Yeah that's great thank you. The booklet that you held up that resource available online at um, compass. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just disappear Jared. <laughs> thank you for sharing that and those views. Um, thank you. And again, thank you, everybody, um, for putting your questions in, in the chat. We will get to some. I just want to ask um, Professor Briony Dow now, um, can you tell us about some of the typical scenarios of elder abuse that you've come across in your research? Sure. Thanks, Justine. Um, yeah, it's really great, Ray, to have that overarching view of um, the prevalence of elder abuse and the, and the kind of characteristics across Australia. What our research, where we've differed a bit in our research, has done a bit of a deeper dive into how this is experienced by older people, what are some of the typical scenarios, and what do they think themselves uh, needs to happen to address the problem of elder abuse as they're experiencing so working with Seniors Rights Victoria, we've interviewed a range of older people who've experienced abuse themselves and tried to understand uh, from their perspective, you know, how it plays out. Um, and I do need to acknowledge, because I see in the, in the chat, there's a lot of questions about aged care. And this, again, is not looking at um, abuse as it occurs in aged care. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that... Um, the, the notion of power imbalance and infringement of rights. Elder abuse is always an infringement of the older person's rights and it always occurs where there's a power imbalance. So those are really important things, I think, to keep in mind. But in terms of scenarios, there's probably no one typical scenario. Um, elder abuse can occur in a very loving and positive and caring relationship. And in the past, this was thought to be, you know, the, the kind of typical scenario of elder abuse where uh, someone caring for someone, uh, perhaps who's living with dementia, um, keeping them up all night, you know, they get totally stressed and at the end of their tether and then they might physically abuse or verbally abuse or neglect the person that they're caring for. for. But we now know that that's probably um, not um, the most common scenario. The sorts of 
I guess, more common scenarios, if you like, uh, in a in a situation of intergenerational relationships. And, and this, again, is where it kind of intersects with family violence, um, that it actually more often, outside of aged care, occurs within the family context. So a much more common scenario would be where a son or a daughter or a, a son-in-law um, perpetrates the abuse um, because, you know, and it might be in a circumstance where they move back in with the parent or they've never left um, and they don't, they share their resources, they don't contribute financially or they start financially abusing them by, by getting their bank account details and emptying their bank account. Um, they don't contribute to household expenses. And often um, what we find is that abuse uh, escalates over time. So um, it may start with a fairly minor um, infringements of the person's rights or their financial uh, situation and then, and then escalate over time. Um, and I think there's some slides where we've got actually some quotes from older people themselves and how they've experienced abuse. And I'll just talk to those um, particular examples if I can. So as you can see, so the, the first one is an, an older woman who was living uh, co living with her, her son and um, he was wanting her to um, give, wanting her to give him money. And um, the quote is that, you know, uh, he was screaming, yelling, and he said he would bring men. And even now that I'm scared, uh, I've a lot of bad friends, 10 people, you're my mother and you have to help me. And she indeed did, did feel that she should help him as well. So there's, there's also this tension, particularly when it's uh, a, uh, the offspring, the child, the adult son or daughter of the older person, um, between wanting to um, care for them, wanting to do what's right for them, or wanting to fix the underlying problem, which is often um, the risk factor that's led to the abuse occurring. So they might want to fix the person's mental health issue, or they might want to fix uh, the gambling addiction or drug addiction or the or the um, whatever the problem is that's caused um, the abuse to start, or in their view, caused the abuse to occur. For the second one, I was virtually a prisoner. I had no money. They took control over my money and I could take no one to the house. This scenario was where an older woman had um, had sold her house with an agreement that the daughter that she could share the house uh, a house with the daughter and her family. And this is again something that occurs um, more regularly than it should, where there's an arrangement made which has never really got a formal contract, but the uh, older person agrees to sell the house and and perhaps have a granny flat um, uh, built in the backyard of the of the of the adult son or daughter's home. So this woman did do that. She, um, she sold her house and she moved in with her daughter, but she was treated really, really badly in that, in that situation. So she was not allowed to use the, um, the kitchen facilities, the laundry facilities. She had to go down to the laundromat to do her washing um, uh, and, you know, was virtually a prisoner in her own house, had no money and had a, had a terrible time. Um, what I, I think it's always important to note, and this is picking up on some of Jared's point, what got her out of that situation was her um, was her other daughter. So having it's also really important that people stay engaged with with broader social connections because it's actually often the other family members um, that get the um, get get the person who's being abused out of that situation. Um, I think I've spoken to this slide, um, you know, that you, you can't just say you're a bad son, you can't just can't just shut them off. And these are some of the risk perpetrator risk factors that are underlying the abuse and often other things, as I said, that the older person who is experiencing the abuse wants um, uh, wants to have addressed. What's really important though, and we asked in this study older people, well, what would, what, what's your message to the broader community about elder abuse? What do you want people to know? And what they said was, if you think you're being abused, you probably are, so seek help early. The hardest thing is to admit it to yourself that that's what's happening and to admit to yourself that, um, that you actually need help. Um, but also it doesn't define me being someone who's been abused, whether it's by a family member or someone else, doesn't define me. I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. And it's really important, I think, that we recognise um, 
the strengths of the older person as well in that situation and their uh, ability to get themselves out of it so long as they understand what their rights and entitlements and a pathway out might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, that, that language that, that you're using around I, I, I'm not a victim, I, I'm a survivor, the parallels between that and the language we use around family violence. We know that elder abuse is not new, but calling it out. Is, is new. Um, thank you so much for that. I just want to refer to um, a question in the, in the chat that I could, could um, throw to the panel. Um, so this is one, knowing that vul vulnerability and dependence increases post age 65 and incidents of dementia and frailty are more prominent. Who is there to protect people who do not have capacity to speak up for themselves? That's a big question. Um, I think it's a really good question and a really serious one. Um, what do we do if um, somebody can't speak up for themselves? And I think that's where the responsibility lies with all of us, uh, professionally and um, personally, to um, to have eyes on to um, to situations that may be occurring, whether that's um, in, in the neighbourhood or in the family or whatever. When, um, during the pandemic, when we were all locked down, particularly here in Victoria, one of the things that happened was those kind of eyes on, if you like, um, were, were sub substantially reduced. So formal services weren't going in, um, people weren't able to connect with family members. And as I said, often the family member that actually does something about the abuse, may not have been able to visit. And I guess one of the things that enables abuse to continue to occur is social isolation of the older person. So I think, yeah, it's a broader responsibility for all of us to keep eyes on and um, ensure that where somebody can't speak for themselves, that they have, that we advocate on their behalf and ensure that, that um, the elder abuse is addressed. I think Jared wanted to have a comment as well. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And in Victoria, some of the learnings as part of the Family Violence Royal Commission strategy was, Rick, thinking about where older people might actually disclose um, those sort of incidents where they're vulnerable. And so there's been a lot of investment not only in terms of family violence training for staff, but also in terms of elder abuse, say, in the hospital setting. Um, it's not uncommon for an older person to disclose something like abuse or the fear of going back home. Um, say if an adult son or daughter is living at home and they're the perpetrator, it could be that if there's a visit to a hospital becomes the trigger for a conversation. And so I think that's one of the really important parts of our wider strategy is do professionals across a whole range of those intersecting areas where older people are likely to interact, do they understand that there's a helpline and national helpline? Do they understand the other resources that are available? So I think from a national perspective, we can do more in educating a whole range of other professionals about what is elder abuse and the type of pathways to support that are available. Thank you. Thank you. Can I move on to our next question for Ray? Is that okay? Thank you. Ray, can you tell us um, about what the research showed about abuse occurring in cold communities and subgroups? Yes, um, that's a very important question, Justine. Our research um, showed that the overall prevalence rate of elder abuse among our call participants um, was the same as our non-call participants at 15%. Uh, what I'll say is that 4% uh, of them nominated experiencing the uh, called specific subtype of abuse um, of abuse relating to language or culture. Um, and we measured that by asking quick questions around um, you know, whether you'd been disrespected because of race, culture or eth ethnicity, uh, whether there was mistranslation of legal documents, um, whether there was denial of in important information in your preferred language, um, uh, making you feel that you're just free labour, like childcare, um, limiting uh, and restricting contact with family and friends from the same cultural background, um, and limiting access to culturally familiar activities. 
Um, so 4% of the called subsample had experienced those kinds of things. Um, the patterns for the other subtypes of abuse in the called subsample were similar. Um, but what I'll say is that we conclude in the report that we need to understand more about the intersection between racism and ageism for the called subsample or called participants. Um, because what we found was that they were at a higher risk from social connections um, than the non-called participants. Um, and there are also slightly different patterns in the prevalence of different kinds of family members uh, as perpetrators for the called subgroup. Uh, so there are similarities, there are differences, and it's important to um, understand more about why we're seeing some of the different patterns. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I, I'll ask you this question from the chat as well. Um, if the prevalence rate is about 15% but recognised as grossly underreported, what would be a reasonable as estimate then in Australia and does it correspond with overseas prevalence rates? Are you able to answer that, Ray, or, or, or Jared? I am. Or, I am. Yeah. When we yeah. refer to the underreporting of prevalence uh, of, of elder abuse, what we're referring to is underreporting to services. Um, in a survey such as this, uh, we don't feel there's a significant amount of underreporting because we ask um, a number of questions that are very specific um, that people answer and they're objective kind of questions. Um, so underreporting refers to underreporting to services uh, rather than underreporting in research. Um, interestingly, our findings are very similar um, to meta-analytic research that's been done based on uh, international samples of English speaking or similar countries. Um, and one of those meta-analysis came up with a, a prevalence rate of 17%. Um, so overall, it's very similar to some of the prevalence studies overseas, though I should say that they vary according to um, measurement techniques and methodology. So there are some complexities there. Um, and we have found, or, or the international meta-analysis found a higher rate of financial abuse. Um, I think that is connected to the fact that financial, one of the drivers of financial abuse is financial disadvantage. Um, and in Australia, we have higher levels of um, economic advantage. And I suspect that that's what, what's driving that dynamic. Thank you. I've got a question each for, um, for Gerard and Bryony. And of course, 60 minutes is never going to be enough or something like this, because we're like heading quickly into the last 15 minutes. Um, uh, Gerard, um, you were first appointed to the role of Commissioner for Seniors a decade ago, and, and the first Commissioner as well. Can you tell us what's changed in that time in terms of awareness and understanding of elder abuse? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Justine. Uh, for me, and I was just reflecting on this recently, um, I referred to that 100 people that I talked about earlier in the room. I can say that when I first started the role as Ambassador for Elder Abuse in 2016, I'd be lucky if one in 10 older people themselves had even heard of elder abuse or had a reasonable understanding of what it, what it is. Now, anywhere I go, that number is more than half. Um, and you obviously look at that both ways. We've come a long way in a fairly short period of time um, in helping the average older person better identify that it's actually abuse that they can do something about. Because, of course, that's a massive barrier. If someone doesn't identify that this, you know, um, is characterised as abuse and that they've got rights and there are things that they can do about it, of course, they're not going to be in a position to take any action. So I think that's an enormous progress that I've seen. It's just that the level of community understanding, things like the prevalence study, so many organisations are paying a much greater interest in it. Uh, clearly, we've got still a long way to go. Um, but I think that's been a massive progress that, that I see, that there's a much wider understanding amongst older people themselves about what abuse is and that there are actually pathways and resources to support. Yeah, that's, that's enormously reassuring, isn't it? <laughs> that's, yeah, 
That's so reassuring. Uh, Briali, um, what do you see is already working and, and how do we capitalise on that in terms of knowledge and reporting? Yeah, thanks, Justine. Um, I think it's really, it's important to recognise the complexity of elder abuse. It really is complex. It takes many forms. So responses to elder abuse need to address that complexity. So what, what we know works, what there's evidence for, is really a combination of services that, if you like, wrap around the older person and minimise the need for them to navigate their own pathway. And by that I mean wherever they enter the service system, whether through health or through legal or through social systems, that they are helped to get the services and um, that they need without delay and also with hands-on guidance, if you like, rather than just a list of referrals, you know, names and agencies. Because um, there's a lot of anxiety and shame associated with reporting and acting on elder abuse especially, as I said earlier, when it's perpetrated by the person's son or daughter, and a lot of ambivalence, often wanting the problem, as I said earlier, that underlines the, underlies the abuse solved, um, not wanting to lose contact with the perpetrator or their grandchildren, which is often the cost of, um, of actually addressing the elder abuse. So it's a really tough decision. So when that older person is ready to disclose and to actually do something about um, the the abuse there needs to be no no wrong door if you like whatever part of the service system they enter they need to get the, the help they need um, and the health justice partnerships which are um, part the, there have been 12 pilots um, as part of the national plan to address elder abuse out of the attorney general's department nationally um, are a good example of these types of services. So that's where a combination of, of a coordinator or case manager, health, legal, um, elder abuse advocacy, and potentially financial counselling services are offered in combination or as a partnership between organisations. So as I said, they can kind of wrap the services around the needs of the older person. But it's also important to remember that they may not be ready to, that, that somebody may disclose uh, something, but they may not be ready to take action. So services also need to be very patient and supportive and let the older, like, let the older person know what their rights are, but also be ready to respond in a timely manner when the older person themselves is ready to take action. Um, so that's what the evidence tells us in the evaluation of those 12 um, pilot programs that um, have recently just um, uh, the evaluations, and I'll, I'll also share the link to that. The evaluations have just recently um, been launched. Thank you. Thank you. I just do want to say to everybody that um, everything that we have talked about will be sent out as links with an email to everybody tomorrow if it's not appearing in the Q&A. It will be sent out directly tomorrow. Um, Let's make another have... comment. I should have mentioned uh, when we were talking about people living with dementia or cognitive decline that we've actually co-designed a series of videos on how to respond um, in the context of dementia. Um, and Bev will also put that uh, link up in the chat for everybody. It's also on the Compass website as well as the NARI website. Thanks so much. Thank you. There's been um, there's been a lot of questions about um, powers of attorneys, um, and, and somebody's asked. Um, there doesn't appear to be any background check appeared. Uh, sorry, background check um, performed during applications. Um, are there any moves towards a central registry um, managed by VCAT or NCAT? Um, does anybody want to respond to that around wills and power? Powers of Attorney. Yeah, very happy to do that. Just pity Kay Patterson's not here with us. This is one of her um, absolute pet issues um, as Age Discrimination Commissioner. One of the commitments in the National Elder Abuse Strategy is to look at the issue of harmonising powers of attorney across Australia. 
and looking at the feasibility of setting up a registry. And I think it's sort of with the whole focus over the last couple of years around COVID, there are a number of really important projects that just haven't got to the, the light of day that they need. And so I'd sort of remind ourselves that that has been named as one of the critical issues for our governments across Australia to look at. You know, can we in fact have a standardised national approach to powers of attorney? And can we also um, set up a system of registers because I know it's a in the um, in a number of the investigations the banking sector for example have talked about the challenges they have if they can't identify what is the current power of attorney and the other comment because I noticed uh, you know, a number of comments about powers of attorney Justine as well just reminding ourselves that older people can change who they they want to appoint that was one of the things that came up when we worked with older people about the type of advice you know it's it's not a set and forget thing you know you don't pick somebody and then 20 years later feel you have to have that same person so if an older person changes their view about who the right trusted person is they can change their power of attorney to make sure that they've got the right person um, available to advocate for them. Thank you, thank you. Um, it, it's just remarkable to see how much has changed and, you know, even the fact that we have a national plan, it's extraordinary, really. Um, we have eight minutes left. And, and, and can I just ask each of our esteemed panellists, um, some closing comments, you know, the breadth of research, the information, the language we have to name and respond. Um, can you just get those? I mean, despite the awfulness of elder abuse, I feel a great deal of optimism, actually, that so much is happening around this. Can you just give us some closing remarks around what you see, what more is there to do? And, and do you feel a level of optimism? Is that a fair question to ask? Ray, if we take your closing remarks first. Thanks, Justine. Look, I, I do feel optimistic because there is, we have so much more knowledge now and there is so much more awareness and, and there, there is a lot of activity. Um, we do have a long way to go. Um, you know, compared to family violence, which we've been focusing on, um, since, you know, the, the, the 2000s with the first national plan in 2009, um, we, we have much further to go with elder abuse. Uh, we do need more knowledge development, particularly in the context of people with cognitive decline and in residential care settings. Uh, we also need to understand more about the Aboriginal or the First Nations experience of elder abuse uh, and the ways that people in... Um, groups such as the LGBTI groups, um, you know, ha how it looks to them and what are the solutions for them. I would say that we need to design um, services and solutions um, in partnership uh, with older people and with those specific groups um, because it is a complex area and we need to ask them how to meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gerard? Yeah, thanks. I, look, I'd want to acknowledge I've had a chance to read some of the, the comments that have been put up in the Q&A that we haven't had a lot of opportunity to, to focus, say, on residential aged care today. Um, and I just sort of point people to the serious incident response scheme. There are structural responses available um, and the role of police in each jurisdiction if it's um, you know risk of a criminal offence. So I sort of want to acknowledge that we haven't had a chance to get to that topic today. Um, one of the areas in terms of the gaps, Justine, for me is the focus we also need to have about support for perpetrators. One of the things that, um, you know, I'm very fortunate because of my role, lots of older people disclose privately the sort of challenges they have, and it's not uncommon for, to hear an older person say, but I want to maintain the relationship. Um, the key driver to the trigger of abuse is actually a crisis in that person's life. And it might be a mental health crisis, drug and alcohol. And so there are times where the nature of the abuse, and this is in no way, you know, wanting to have an excuse, but it, it's that the ability to address the abuse also needs to find solutions for the perpetrator. And so if they're drug and alcohol, gambling, mental health issues that are key drivers, we can't forget that, you know, a systemic response will also 
also look for what type of supports are available for the perpetrator, it, again, as a part of the strategy of removing the risk of abuse. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's, um, that's excellent closing remarks. Thank you. Bye, um, thanks, Justine. Yeah, I, f I fully endorse uh, all the comments that Ray and Jared have made um, and don't have a lot to add, except I think there's probably um, a reason why all the questions in the chat are on those topics um, that we don't know as much about. I think we don't know as much about really what are the drivers of elder abuse in residential aged care, whether that's um, perpetrated by um, professionals or other uh, residents. And I think that's an area that we really need to know a lot about. We don't know a lot about sexual abuse of older people. And, uh, you know, there's a whole range of reasons why why that's the case. Um, it's very it's very shameful um, for, the, for the victim, if you like, to disclose. Um, and uh, so we need to know a lot more about that. And we do need to know more about how our social systems um, perpetrate elder abuse sometimes, whether that be uh, regulatory systems um, or, um, or services themselves. Um, so I think that um, we've had some great questions that we don't have the answers for, but that help us to guide where we, where we need the answers um, in the future. But in terms of optimism, I, I, I think there's much greater awareness, much greater awareness of elder abuse. And there's been a lot of work done. There really was very little evidence about what worked. Um, and so there's a lot more um, work that's been done to try different responses and, and understand better what works in responding to elder abuse. So I'm optimistic from that perspective. Thank you all so much. Um... I just want to thank those who are attending the webinar as well for your engagement and contribution to this. Um, please do com contact um, Compass directly if you want your question at inquiry at compass, compass.info. A massive, massive thanks to our um, panelists. Um, it's such an impressive body of work and commitment to tackling elder abuse, Professor Bryony Dow, Commissioner for Seniors Victoria and Ambassador for Elder Abuse, Jared Manson and Dr. Ray Caspi. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention. We're going to just flash the results of the poll up. Um, I do want to say, um, we'll just take a second on that. If this has raised any issues for you, please don't forget the helpline 1-800-353-374, 1-800-353-374. Resources are available on the Compass website, compass.info. Yes, there'll be some analysis from Compass of the, the poll results. Please do register with compass.info uh, for the next three webinars that we have coming up. Five Types of Elder Abuse, Thursday, 1st of June, Ageism, Thursday, 29th of June, Perpetrators of El Elder Abuse, Thursday, 23rd of July, they're all at 12.30. You can subscribe to the Compass e, e newsletter, compass.info, keep in touch with what's coming up. Thank you so much to the panel, thank you to you all being part of this. My name is Justine Sless. It has been a pleasure to facilitate this important panel on elder abuse. Thank you so much. <laughs>